Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you some fun experiments you can do with unusual sugars. So today we have mannose, not mannose hands of fate, but D-mannose. And this has the unusual property that it spontaneously changes from sweet tasting to bitter tasting after you dissolve it in water. So I've got a little experiment here. Um, and if you want to try this at home, I, I would recommend it. It's a fun thing to do with a class of students, for example. Uh, just put the same amount of this mannose into two equal-sized containers and add a little water to one container and let it sit for about an hour, which I've done with this one. Then add water to the second container, same amount, and mix it up and do a taste test. So I'm going to start with the fresh one that I just mixed up a minute ago. It's pleasantly sweet. I don't taste any bitterness at all. And now let's try the 60-minute old one. It's, it's really quite unpleasant. The difference is shocking. No one is going to miss this. However, if you do try it, put your results in the comments since some of this might be taste bud dependent. Um, let's try another one. We have fructose, and this is fructose in water at room temperature. It's pretty cold out here now. And then I also have fructose that has been warmed up to 65 C. Now in this case, it's important to make the concentration a little bit lower. So I would use a very small amount of fructose in the water. So again, let's start with the cold one. It's very sweet. I should have probably used even less. And let's try the warm one. Again, the difference is actually pretty large. The warm one is much less sweet. It's not bitter, but it is much less sweet. Now you might be thinking, well, it's just a perceptual thing. Clearly warm things might just taste less sweet due to the way taste buds work. So as the control, I also have just plain old sucrose, which is table sugar, and uh, also cold and warm. So let's try that one. Um, with equal amounts, equal concentrations, it's less sweet than the fructose. And let's try the warm one. I, I think the difference is pretty big. I mean, it's to do this for real, you should be, you know, blinded and everything. But if you do play around with this, it's fun to just get a couple bags of these sugars if you're doing this experiment with a class and try all this out. It's really quite striking. And what's interesting is that not only can you taste the difference, you can see the difference. If you put these solutions between crossed polarizers, you can actually see the molecular conformation changing in real time uh, over time or due to temperature. So in the case of the mannose, this happens spontaneously over time, and in the case of fructose, it happens uh, in response to temperature. This property of how a chemical can change how it rotates the polarization of light is called muta rotation, and it's surprisingly common. Uh, if you're new to all this, check out Steve Mould's excellent video on how a chemical compound can rotate the polarization of light in the first place. He does a great job of explaining how a whole bunch of randomly oriented molecules are sort of like little corkscrews and how the, the bulk property eventually uh, rotates light. Also, another interesting fact is that when we talk about a molecule like glucose, all of the naturally occurring glucose in the world is right-handed, meaning if the direction of light is going in your thumb, the curl of your fingers describes how the light will be, how the plane of uh, polarization will be rotated. This is really interesting because there has been no evolutionary pressure to create any enzymes or anything else that work with L-glucose. So all of the L-glucose in the world has been made in a lab, as far as I'm aware. And this is interesting because these happen to taste exactly the same. If you synthesize some L-glucose in the lab, it tastes identical to D-glucose. But you're eating something from the mirror universe, and nature has never had a reason to process this, meaning there's no calories in L-glucose. You can eat all of this as, as much as you want, and you'll never gain a single calorie from it. So it's actually a very economically interesting thing to build. So a while ago, I came across a paper in which the researchers claimed they had found an enzymatic way to produce L-glucose from feedstocks that are naturally occurring. This would be a tremendous discovery, and I, I know there have been a few companies over the years that have tried to come up with this. Remember, making this is very expensive and difficult to do in the lab. So if we had an enzymatic way of producing it, that could potentially be um, commercially viable. Anyway, the, um, the paper probably has a big mistake in it, and in a future video I'm going to do a much more in-depth analysis of 
what they thought happened and what I think happened and, and why this is, if they, if they actually made this work, it would be a company by now. But anyway, in the course of all this, I had to come up with some tools to measure the rotation of light, right? Like if we're going to do these experiments and prove that you made left-handed glucose that operates on, you know, the left-handed rule, you have to have a way of measuring that very carefully. So I built a polarimeter, which measures the optical rotation of anything you put in there. And I was surprised that when I mixed up some uh, glucose from the store just to check if my polarimeter was working, it returned a value that was completely wrong compared to the textbook. This is very strange because it was way off. It was not like a small calibration error. Um, and I you know, mixed up a fresh batch and got the same wrong answer again. So I left it sitting there for a day. And when I came back the next day, I measured it and it had exactly the correct value. And this is when it dawned on me that muter rotation is a thing. It's one of those things that if you didn't know to search the internet for muter rotation or spontaneous change in optical rotation, how would you even know it exists, right? Like if you just look up the optical rotation of glucose, there will be a number in Wikipedia. But when you mix it up fresh from a solution, you will not get that number because of this muter rotation effect. So you might be thinking that this muter rotation effect has something to do with like an equilibrium between the right-handed and left-handed forms of glucose, for example. But that's not true. Remember, 100% of the glucose in nature is right-handed. So this muter rotation effect, and glucose is a big muter rotator, um, comes from a different source. So if we look at just D-glucose, there's actually two forms of it, the alpha and the beta form. And you'll notice that sometimes glucose is written as a, a linear structure like this, and sometimes it's written as a cyclic structure like this. And that is actually true to nature. It's, it is likely, I mean, it's, it's happening all the time, that one of these cyclic structures opens up, like the ring basically just pops open due to thermodynamic effects. And when the ring recloses, sometimes it closes with the OH going down, and sometimes it closes with the OH going up. And that's just a fact that, you know, some of these bonds you can think of are sort of able to pivot around. Now, when the ring is closed, it can't freely pivot around. But as we said, just due to just random thermodynamics, the ring will pop open. And if the thing happens to swing around and the ring recloses, then you end up with the other form. Um, I, I'm blown away by all this complexity. Like you think, oh, you know, glucose is the most basic thing ever, but all this is going on all the time uh, in equilibrium. And if you change the temperature or the pH or the um, solvent that you're using, you can shift the equilibrium between alpha and beta. Now, as it happens, the alpha and beta form each rotate light a little differently. They're both right-handed, but they have different um, intensities of twisting. Like it's the, um, one of them is much more effective at, at rotating the polarization of light than the other. So you can measure how much alpha and how much beta you have in your solution by measuring the total amount of rotation. And if you already knew what pure alpha does and what pure beta does, and you sort of combine them together, the average is what you get in your solution. Now, as it, as it happens with glucose, these taste exactly the same. So you can't really perceptually taste the difference, although you can see it in the polarimeter very easily. Um, but in the case of, for example, mannose, they taste very different. And so if you're starting off with pure beta form and you put that in water, over time through this equilibrium, you will end up with more of the other form until it reaches whatever equilibrium is determined by the temperature and the pH and the solvent type and all that stuff. So then the next question is, how do you even end up with a pure form? Like imagine that you had this blend of alpha and beta, 50-50, let's just say, and you dried it out. Don't you have 50-50 crystals? As it turns out, no, this is what gets really weird. Sometimes, depending again on the exact molecule, when you dry out your solution, there could be a thermodynamic preference for one form or the other. So as it's drying out and crystallizing, you may get entirely beta crystals for that particular type of sugar. Then when you redissolve it in water again, it takes some time for it to reform the alpha form. I mean, this is crazy, right? It's almost like we're talking about separate chemicals here. And yet this is going on, you know, every time you take a sip of soda, all this equilibrium is going on. And, uh, you know, the alpha and beta forms play different roles in other types of chemistry. So, for example, if you link up beta glucose over and over again, you end up with cellulose. And if you link up alpha glucose over and over, you end up with starch. And these are dramatically different in terms of diet. Obviously, we can eat starch and get calories out of it. 
but we do not have enzymes to process cellulose and get calories out of that. Even though it's the same glucose, it's just this one flip of the OH group that changes all these properties. Now, if you think that's wild, fructose is even more complicated. In this case, not only are there alpha and beta forms, but when I was talking about the ring kind of opening and closing with, um, with fructose, sometimes the ring opens and closes to make like a five carbon ring with one carbon hanging off, and sometimes it closes to make a six carbon ring. And those two forms are called the furanose and the purinose forms. And each one of those has an alpha and a beta. And each one of these has different amounts of optical rotation and different uh, sweetnesses. So in the case of, um, of uh, fructose, if you change the temperature, you're changing the equilibrium between all of these different forms all at the same time. And these will, this will have an effect on the overall sweetness. Now remember, all these different forms are still all right-handed. This is all D-fructose. And so all of these things exist in the mirror universe as well. So one molecule of fructose could be one of eight different things, D, alpha D, fructopyranose, all these other iterations, and then the same thing all over again for L. And that's just one molecule. There's dozens of simple sugars out there, and each one of them has all of these different variations. So there's really hundreds of different small sugar individual molecules when you get down to the exact conformation you're talking about. So one last little bit of complexity before we move on to something else. D-fructose actually rotates light to the left. It follows the left-hand rule, whereas D-glucose has the right-hand rule. So the D and the L actually do not indicate the direction of the light twisting, which is especially annoying, isn't it? Um, and this was in fact the mistake that I think was made in that research paper that I, that I mentioned. And so there's one more bit of notation uh, that you sometimes see in chemistry. So you'll see like L plus fructose, meaning that the L form actually has positive rotation, or D minus fructose. And so this one follows this rule, whereas glucose is the opposite. Glucose would be D plus and L minus. <laughs> so if this isn't confusing enough, uh, you know, you're probably a chemist. But um, I, I was surprised at how complex all these things are. And um, I, I'm sure we'll end up talking about this again when I, when I show off my... Um, chromatography setup and we get into the details there. But I wanted to end with one interesting visual thing that I found. When we look down through a tall graduated cylinder of a sugar solution, of course you can see the color change and that's because this optical rotation is also wavelength sensitive. But if you look at the reflection in the graduated cylinder, you can see these four radial arms that are also twisting, um, spiraling. And as it happens, when we look at glucose, they spiral to the right, following the right-hand rule. And when we look at fructose, they twist the other way. It's, it's following the left-hand rule. So this is not immediately obvious. Like I searched around the internet for, you know, curved reflections or, you know, it's, it's really not obvious how the geometry is affected by this optical rotation. It really should just be the polarization. Um, it's just this weird sort of interplay between reflections off of glass in a medium that is constantly rotating the direction of the polarization. So if you're into photography, you might know that you use a polarizing filter on the front of your lens to eliminate reflections from like a car windshield or a um, puddle of water, for example. And in this case, a similar thing is happening. We have polarized light being reflected off of glass Basically, the polarized light is coming up from the bottom and reflecting off the inside of the graduated cylinder, but the medium in the graduated cylinder is also constantly rotating the direction of the polarization. And it just happens to be, again, with all these weird things happening all at the same time, you end up with this really cool spiral effect showing you the actual rotation. So to test this, I started off with rotation in one direction, and I made a mixture of fructose and glucose that should have no net optical rotation. So remember, one's going clockwise, one's going counterclockwise, and if you mix the two in the right proportion, you can cancel it all out. And sure enough, you can end up with straight radial arms showing that there's no rotation going on uh, because we achieved the right ratio. And as it happens, that ratio is just about what high fructose corn syrup is. It's pretty close to 50-50. 
And um, if you haven't seen a recent video from the Reactions YouTube channel, you got to check it out. Uh, everyone talks about Mexican Coke being superior because it's made with sucrose, cane sugar, instead of high fructose corn syrup. But as it turns out, this, this one blew my mind too, Coke is so acidic that a, the acid environment in the bottle of Coke is enough to crack the sucrose apart into glucose and fructose. So they're chemically almost identical to high fructose corn syrup after it sits on the shelf for a few weeks or months or whatever. Pretty cool stuff. I, I'm, I'm really into carb chemistry uh, recently, and uh, you'll, you'll see in my next video that we get some more chromatography going. I hope you found that interesting, and I hope you have a great start to 2025. See you next time. Bye.